America. Hey, welcome back to the show. This is the Eric Ferris Show, and uh, we're in the middle of hour number three. And uh, I've been looking forward to this interview. Uh, hour number three guest, first time she's joined the program. We're joined now by Catherine Tempf. She's a reporter for Campus Reform. It's a watchdog organization that uh, trumpets stories of waste. I mean, excuse me, stories of, well, a lot of waste there, too, but uh, bias and abuse on college campuses. It's a subject that we've talked about long and hard on our show about just some of the crazy stuff that's coming out of schools, whether it's elementary schools, high schools, and particularly colleges across the country. But uh, I'm excited about this interview. So let's welcome to the show. Let's welcome Catherine to our show. Catherine, hey, welcome to the Eric Ferris Show. Hi, thank you. Hey, uh, glad you could join us today. Thanks for taking some time out of your Sunday and your weekend to uh, join us and our listeners today. So, Catherine, you're a reporter for Campus Reform. Give us a little bit of background bio on you. Well, Campus Reform, what we do is we report on waste, fraud, bias, and abuse on college campuses. So we've done a lot of stuff with Obamacare. We've done a lot of stuff where we've had students emailing us videos of professors basically ranting against conservatives, calling them racist, misogynist, things like that on campus, kind of just trying to provide a voice for conservatives that maybe don't have one so much on liberal college campuses. And uh, Catherine, you've you've had a you've had a, a wide ranging career so far. You do some comedy work. Uh, tell us a little bit about your mm-hmm. career itself. Oh yes, um, I've lived in LA. I've lived in DC. I live in New York now. I do stand up comedy. I do TV, radio, to do traffic reporting, pretty much everything. But on campus, reform, I basically just like spend a lot of time on campuses and talking to students and, and that sort of thing. Sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, so I want to yeah. get it. I want to get into uh, I want to get into some of uh, of the stories that you've been covering recently. But by the way, before we get into that, I want to give you an opportunity, kind of shameless plug, because I know our listeners want to be able to connect with you online. Uh, you've got a website, online presence. Give that out for our listeners, okay? Uh, yeah, my website is CatherineTimps.com. My last name is T I M P S, and also on Twitter, I'm at K C Timps. My middle name is Claire. So. Okay. All right. I want listeners to check that out. And uh, we uh, did provide on the Eric Ferris Show, the Facebook page, we provided an image that includes uh, that contact information for our guest as well. And so I'll tell our listeners to check that out as well and make sure they connect with uh, Catherine online. All right. So I want to cover some stories that you've been covering recently uh, and talk about that. Just on Friday, you, you posted a great website, by the way, you have there at campusreform.org. And I would definitely recommend our, our listeners check that out. But you're real, quite prolific, Catherine. And in the stories that you've been covering. And just on Friday, you covered a couple stories that we've been talking about. Uh, first, tell us about this uh, the State University in, in New York, this Beamington, and what they've done here in the university newspaper. Uh, tell our listeners about that. Oh, well, basically, they just posted a guide to if you want to have sex on campus, on college, what are some great places you can go to have sex? And they also have specific suggestions of what times to go, what different types of sexual activities might be appropriate in the different locations. They're saying that public library sex is probably getting boring, so they wanted to help out um, students who are looking for somewhere more interesting to have public sex. You know, I, I look at this, and I mean, I'm not that far removed from being on a college campus. I'm a graduate uh, two degrees from the University of Missouri in Columbia, and it's kind of known as a party school, you know. But, uh, I, I mean, if, if students were doing it, uh, they were doing it in dorm rooms and apartments and, and uh, duplexes and, and things like that. They were not necessarily looking to check out public places of – front doors, back doors, study rooms, stuff like that, to have to, to have to look to, particularly of all things, the university, to actually well, provide this information. Right. I mean, it doesn't really matter where you're doing it. I think it's just kind of a thing that you can figure out for yourself, as opposed to needing to look to the school newspaper to decide where you should have sex. Yeah, I mean, and for, <laughs> for, the, for the school to somehow get behind this is, is amazing to me, and including even this article goes into, as you put in your article, this article goes into great details. It goes into great details, yeah. Yeah, I mean, some of which would get me into trouble with the FCC for going into some of those details, or at least the right. wording. I don't know how much I could say. Yeah, but I, yeah I understand. We've got, check yeah, it out. Yeah, we've got the, the school is using literally a lot of four-letter words that I'm, I'm not going to use on the air. 
But I mean, basically, if you're if you're starving for it, that's what they're saying. And here's what they're saying <laughs> how to go about it, including mm-hmm. they even cite that a, cat- a certain category is um, a certain study room is a good place for anal sex. Even right. Right. Yeah. They say because those doors lock, they very specifically advise that area for that activity. <laughs> And again, I mean, on all these stories that we cover, and we've been covering this a lot on our show, that we come across a lot of the stuff that happens on campuses, uh, some of which you've, your organization has done a fantastic job in, in reporting. I mean, again, I just go, I understand that people can be people and kids can be kids and stuff like that. And hormones get, you know, get in control of them and, and all that. But I mean, for the university to get behind this and the university to get behind a lot of the other stuff that we've seen, I mean, is it any great surprise that, that our education system is in shambles, quite frankly, when, <laughs> when we're not paying attention to the, you know, the uh, reading, writing and arithmetic type stuff. But instead, you know, we're, we're focusing on on outside uh, resources and providing resource information to students on public locations to have anal sex, of all things. Right. Well, this is the official student newspaper. So these are kids that are trying to be journalists. And they should be teaching them things they, they can actually use um, in the future rather than, you know, the youth unemployment is so low right now. More than half of kids who graduate from college either unemployed or underemployed and probably could find better things to focus on than where on campus they should have sex. Well, and it almost begs the question, which is, um, you know, if someone – if someone wants to go into journalism and they're writing these types of uh, of, of okay. hardcore articles and they get out there and they're providing this as, as examples of work product and you're someone who's who's been you know interviewed and things like that. I mean, does this somehow give you a leg up with employers to show uh, how you wrote articles? Definitely not. And it's, it's not even like you would have to provide it as a sample because of the Internet now. I mean, these students have their name on it. You just all you have to do is Google them. And that's one of the things that would come up. So, uh, I mean, it's harmful even if it's not what they're learning. Just to even have something like that out there. A lot of employers would definitely not like to see that. Well, and this article of yours covers the fact that, that the article itself, and this is a state university in, in New York, I mean, the details this goes into that, if, for example, if you, if you want to just go to the library, that one of the, the places to go to is the Arabic section after 11 o'clock. Right. Right, because very specific. Evidently, that's that's I guess a not very popular area to be in. So there's going to be a fair amount of privacy, I guess, until the students read this and they start populating the place. But right, that's what I thought. If everybody looks at the exact same article, and all of a sudden you have everybody in a theater balcony, and you have everybody in bumping to each other in the Arabic room. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, I, I, I would almost think it would be kind of a kick to uh, be on campus and, and just go up to the Arabic section around 11 o'clock and just kind of take note of who's who's kind of uh, walking around uh, trying to pretend that they're, they're, they're checking out the Arabic books there. Right, and that kind of says something also about the authors of the article. I mean, that's... Yeah, how do they know it? It seems like a little bit too much personal information that I would want on the Internet about myself. Well, that uh, brings into question what research they did to uh, to come to the information they had, so... Right, right, right. <laughs> they had a lot of details. Catherine, let's move on to another story that uh, was released online, written by you, uh, and that's a story out of Dartmouth. Uh, and yeah. again, it just the, the, low, the low level of of ability for anyone to to stay above to stay out of the radar of the politically correct police is amazing mm-hmm. and this the story that yeah. you wrote out of dartmouth uh involves a sorority and a, and a fraternity um both of which has the greek letter of of phi in it uh alpha right. phi which is how it's actually pronounced and and phi delta alpha uh they came up with this cute idea to to use that phi part of their names to come up with a a party to fundraise an event to fundraise for cardiatric care and called a, a fiesta using a play on words on that greek word um right. but evidently that that event has been canceled talk to us about that <laughs> well, yeah, they had this idea to have a fundraiser with virgin pina coladas and raise money for cardiac patients, so people with health problems be able to get care. But one student emailed in and said that Fiesta Cinco de Mayo themes were offensive and they were racist, and so they had to cancel the event. So now there's no money for cardiac patients. <laughs> And, and that, it was offensive. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's because one student, uh, one student complained about that, um, 
Uh, this student, uh, Daniela Hernandez, who describes herself as a Mexican-born, United States-raised student, uh, mm -hmm. you know, she specifically complained. Uh, she said she's a first-generation woman of color. That uh, this, you know, uh, that she was surprised by this party, and that it was insensitive, and 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 go on, and so on and so forth. Uh, and she, you know, she referred to it as being a Cinco de Mayo-inspired event. Uh, right. And, and in looking into this, I mean, what was there pressure that was applied to the uni to the uh, to the two different uh, fraternities? Was there pressure that was applied to them? It seems it seems that that's the case. I mean, the email wasn't just sent to the fraternities; they were sent to all different departments of the school. And basically, what she was saying was that it reinforces stereotypes that associate Mexicans with alcohol. But there was not even going to be any alcohol at this party. They were having virgin pina coladas, and they were trying to raise money for heart care patients, patients that needed help with their heart. It's like a life or death situation. And the whole thing is shut down now because she thought it was offensive to have a fiesta themed party with, with guacamole and burritos and virgin pina coladas. So, I mean, on, on one hand, we have uh, less resources now available for cardiac care patients. Uh, right. But I suppose that, you know, Michael Bloomberg should be happy because maybe, uh, you know, bur burritos and salsa is not the healthiest thing in the world. So, you know, the right. super, super nanny might be inspired by this. Right. Yeah, that's not healthy. Too. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I just the, the depth of which these politically correct policemen and police women go to root out stuff uh, that, again, I, I just don't see the offensive part of this. I mean, Cinco no. de Mayo, on one hand, is pushed at being an event that many people celebrate for a variety of reasons, and many within the Hispanic community celebrate Cinco de Mayo. Uh, but yet, when it's done to raise money for cardiac care, and it's done by maybe someone who's may or may not be a person of color, it becomes offensive. Yeah, this isn't the first time this happened. Uh, Colombia... A sorority got in huge trouble because they threw a Olympics party where everyone dressed as a different country, and the people that were representing Mexico wore sombreros, so they got in a huge trouble because uh, <laughs> they wore sombreros and sh shirts that said Mexico on them. Well, and, and see, uh, my argument would be, and it's a different read than many people, but my argument would be is that, that a Cinco de Mayo-themed uh, party is offensive. Uh, because what it does is it celebrates the uh, non-payment of debt owed to the country of France by the government of Mexico, uh, because that's really the origin of the actual uh, Cinco de Mayo is what it is, is the defeat of uh, French forces who were trying to collect debt. And so basically it's a celebration of a debtor nation, uh, of being a debtor nation. But, th I mean, that, hey, that's just my wacko bird opinion. So Well, no, yeah, nobody talks about that at all. Everyone only really just wants to talk about sombreros and other incredibly offensive things like <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, I want to dive into a couple of more stories with you. Uh, and that is uh, this is a story you also wrote this last week um, about um, a couple of students on the campus at Harvard. And and again, I, I tend to think the way that I think being a free market fan and things like that, that, you know, ingenuity, um, you know, uh, free market values, uh, entrepreneurship, that should be valued uh, by our educational system. Uh, when you take a look at, you know, Bill Gates and the work that he did and basically starting his business that employ has employed millions of people and led to technological, you know, technological changes and innovations that employed millions and millions and millions of people. That all began basically, you know, out of a dorm room. You know, when you look at even Facebook and uh, the, the fact that that was began that began on the campus at Harvard, things like that, that again has has right. created lots of technological advances and employment of people and people reaching out and be able to become more and more interconnected in today's world. I tend to think that's something that should be valued, but evidently Harvard did not value uh, the work of two freshmen that you reported about. Tell our listeners about that story that you covered. Yes, two freshmen decided to start a late night food delivery service called Instanoms because people in certain dorms didn't have the ability to get delivery from a lot of nearby restaurants and a lot of them were studying late and the business was going great and they were getting some real life business experience students were getting food late at night that they needed and the school shut them down saying that they were worried it could cause too much foot traffic that's what the students told me they were worried about too much foot traffic so, so basically the they, so basically <laughs> they had an idea 
They had an idea uh-huh. that would help and assist fellow students. Right. They had an idea that would that would basically result in them making a profit, which they could grow potentially help to the point the of school. of exactly to compensate the school. Maybe they could employ people. In short, they could become a business and a financial success and benefit at the same time consumers. Okay, well, you know right. that's that's a positive positive there, but yet. This atmosphere at Harvard, which, again, was the place where, you know, a variety of entrepreneurs have gone through and created right. businesses while they were there, had concept of creating businesses, uh, has all been shut down uh, because of basically overregulation. Same right. thing. And this was one of the top schools. You think you'd want your graduates to go on and do great things. And you would think you would understand that part of that would be real life experience. And what was the collateral here? What were they so concerned about? Foot traffic. They had to shut it down because the foot traffic would be too much to deal with. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, foot foot traffic on a campus of, you know, some tens of thousands of students anyway. The delivery service was two people bringing food to the dorm. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) So you got so. two people delivering food, and that's just that's just we can't have we cannot have that, Catherine. We cannot have that. <laughs> just, again, it's almost, but it's a it's a it's an allegorical tale to what's going on in a bigger scale. I mean, in America, uh, with government and big government, and wh- and where big government is going with regard to business and things like that. Just it's an allegorical tale that relates back and forth. Yes, exactly. I guess this is maybe the best real-world experience they could have been offered in some ways. Yeah, um, uh, maybe so. It's that uh, you you demonstrate uh, independence, you demonstrate entrepreneurship, you demonstrate the ability to make a profit, you demonstrate the ability to provide a service to consumers, and uh, and you're going to get squashed. So yeah, right, that is. Exactly. A, I guess that is mm-hmm. a real-world experience. That the I guess that is part of what our colleges should be teaching people. Unfortunately, as to where things are going in our society. Right. Well, they did say they're going to try to teach people at other schools how to do the same thing on their campus and kind of switch the role from actually providing the food to a consulting service. So we'll see if they actually end up being able to do that. But definitely at Harvard, they said it's not possible. Unbelievable. Because of the foot traffic. (laughs) Unbelievable. All right. Hey, I'm going to jump on one more story uh, covered by you in just the last week, and that is uh, the story at, uh, at Yale. This is a pro-life group uh, called Chose Life, and uh, it was a provisional member of what the school called its social justice network. And uh, there, this group, uh, which was pro-life, came up for a vote uh, on whether they could go ahead and get full membership. Uh, basically, this group was, uh, uh, you know, pro-life, and it would included volunteer work at a local organization that offers pregnant women information, baby supplies, helping find employment to hopefully deter them from having an abortion instead. Uh, but they were shot down by this right. uh, by this uh, uh, student group. T- tell us, our listeners, what happened with that? Well, they were the first group, actually, to ever be rejected from this social justice network ever in the history of the school. And it's a little weird because there are other groups in there that just, for example, there's a group that just provides progressive policies, recommends and writes new progressive policies and gives them to lawmakers. And whether or not you're pro-life or pro-choice, you can't deny that it is community service to actually raise money and provide baby supplies to women who need help raising their babies. <laughs> so, I mean, regardless of what your views are there, that's definitely a charitable effort. And so I, there could be no other reason that it would have been denied membership other than just political bias. Yeah, I mean, and again, I mean, this isn't like this group was organizing uh, protest marches, uh, you know, life parades around Planned Parenthood. Where they were protesting, right, right, right. you were protesting uh, student health organizations uh, handing out contraceptives on campus. It wasn't something like that. And again, I don't have a problem with that, but it wasn't that. They were just providing resources, helping to provide right. on a volunteer basis for women who did need them. Right. Exactly for a woman who mm-hmm. made the choice, made exactly. the choice yeah. to bring a baby to term, whether it's to raise the child on her own or to bring it to term to let it be adopted by another. That's what they were trying to empower those women who made that choice into doing. But yet they get shot down. Right, right. To give them the freedom to make that choice. I also spoke with one of the students who was on the committee and said that one of the voting members 
actually wore a uh, Yale feminist T-shirt to the vote. She told everybody to vote against them, and they actually wore a feminist shirt also to make sure everybody knew where she stood. <laughs> but she said she that she did not let political bias influence her decision. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, again, this is another example of you hear all the time how the left is the left is the tolerant one. When you find right. that in situations mm-hmm. like this that you see utter intolerance is what you end up seeing. Right. As long as you agree with them, then yeah. So, Catherine, tell us, uh, you're covering a lot of stories. You're doing great work out there, and I appreciate that. Uh, any kind of lead on any kind of news stories you're working on that will be coming out this week? Just take a look, everyone. Keep a look out at campusreform.org. I also encourage students to reach out to us. There's a place for tips on the website. If they have anything they want to tell us about, we've had a lot of students have their stories we brought to light because of that. a lot of the videos that we've had of professors going on the in-classroom rants I talked about earlier. A lot of those came from students or parents who just maybe come look at the website and see what kinds of things are going on on college campuses that they might not know about. All right. We want to make sure that uh, our listeners uh, have a way to, to uh, find you online. I know that uh, your website is campusreform.org. Uh, yeah. But uh, go ahead and give that information out, how they can find you individually online as well, Catherine. Uh, my website is CatherineTimps.com, T-I-M-P-S, and my Twitter is KCTimps. So I'm available. Send me tips. Send us tips. And just check out the website in general. Great. And, and I will tell you, I really like your, I really like your campus reform uh, website and it lists literally all of your articles and it's just a great read to see your work itself and uh, again for our listeners uh, if you've not checked out our Facebook page check out the Eric Ferris show on Facebook and uh, you'll see an image of Catherine and it has all of her information online so you can find her online and, and, and kind of follow the work that she's doing she's doing great work and Catherine I want to thank you for the work that you're doing you're doing a great work as a watchdog and as part of a watchdog group called campus reform Thank you so much. Great. I'd love to have you back on again. And, Catherine, thank you for spending your time with us today, okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, folks, that was Catherine Tempth. And, again, I'll, I'll try to post some information later on our Facebook page uh, about her information. But, again, there is an image online of her. It gives that information out as well. She's doing great work. We'd love to have her on again. Uh, this stuff is amazing, honestly that this kind of stuff is happening on college campuses, that you're seeing the intolerance toward conservative views, that you're seeing, you know, colleges themselves. This isn't some underground organization. Colleges themselves using their official student newspaper to tell students of great locations to have public sex acts on campus. It's just amazing. Hey, folks, we're taking a break. We'll be right back. We've got a lot of great stuff to come on The Eric Ferris Show.